Hey guys, Dominic Neshi here. Today we are talking to Evan Lucas from Invest Smart, and we are going to be talking about the budget, which is actually coming out in uh, later later tonight, later this this about evening. Four or five hours. Yeah, exactly. Evan, thank you for coming on the show. It's been about a year and a half since we caught up last, and and a hell of a lot has changed. Uh, yeah, that's that's one way of putting it. Um, if you look at it, I mean, we're fourteen months into something that most of us in our generation and every generation to life today have never heard of, which is a pandemic in terms of actually seeing and living it. So a lot has changed. Um, Whether it's changed in terms of the economics, which I'm sure we're going to discuss over the next sort of, you know, 10, 15 minutes will be really interesting because personally I don't think it has. And and, and what I mean by that is that, yes, in my world and in your world in in, in property, things are, are absolutely exploding you know, you are seeing a lot of work, inverted commas, being done by central governments and central banks the world over to try and keep their respective economies moving, keep their respective populations in employment and, and making sure, that, you know, we can get through this, this pandemic in a way that they make sure that we're, we're still having a, a, probably the way to say it is, is a, you know, a, a life expectancy slash, you know, a, a lifestyle that we've expected going into the pandemic. So that's the other thing you've got to remember is that I'm a bit cynical when it comes to this, but governments do have a habit of wanting to basically make sure that they're improving your, you know, your quality of life as they refer to it, aka your living standards, um, consistently. And that's technically, if you take outside of, you know, since the Industrial Revolution, that's not normally how life has worked, basically. We've got smarter, which is always what happens, and therefore we've got around that problem over the last 150 years. But in reality, if you actually have a look at what happened before about the 1850s, that was very unlikely to, to keep seeing that kind of constant growth cycle. So that's the other thing that's interesting about this is, is that governments have a vested interest because we are used to a quality of life. And that's why markets are, are also doing what they're doing because the amount of stimulus, the amount of subsidies, the amount of of, of government support is, is unprecedented. Um, and I don't use that word lightly. Even if you go back to the Second World War and First World War, it is unprecedented in terms of, of what they're doing um, and it's likely to continue for the foreseeable future like you know short-term future they want the economy to run off they want people to basically try and bounce out of this you know 14 months like we could never have imagined um, completely like you know it's not a great comparison but if you look at the GFC it's different to that but you know unlike in the GFC where a lot of central governments went down austerity um, and let central banks do the work, this time central banks and central governments and state governments and province governments or whoever you want to choose, they're all working in one direction. That's basically trying to make sure that everybody gets through this as, as much as they can, inverted commas, unscathed as they can. Yeah, it's interesting because I've, I've noticed that th- there are two schools of thought. Some people say, how can it sustainably keep on doing what it's doing and, and we're due for some kind of crash or a cataclysm or a fall? Yep. And then there's the other school of thought where, you know, we, we may be ro- rolling into the, you know, the roaring 20s or a golden age of, of prosperity that we haven't yet seen in a long, long time. And as you've just said, the government is putting a, a tremendous amount of stimulus into the economy to make sure that we feel that. And reading some of the most recent reports, this, this budget it really feels like what they're trying to do. It's about economic recovery, uh, growing the economy so we can deliver those those jobs and trying to get that 5.6% unemployment rate below 5% um, and making sure that they can guarantee those essential services. But, you know, you and I are investors, our businesses and people that listen to us are, are paying attention to this budget and saying, well, how is it going to affect me and my investments and what should I be doing? So, First and foremost, it'll affect your investments in the short term to the positive side. I need to put that out there. So the reason I say that is that when you have a scenario where you are providing subsidies, you are providing government support money functions into into the economy, which is what's going to happen. We've already been basically sort of leaked the main story. I mean, the thing around childcare, the things around aged care, they will filter through. So the childcare one's interesting one from my perspective, and I'll come back to that in a minute because it gets it gets around structure and around how you you know you look at structural reforms versus how you look at what this is, which is subsidy and, and stimulus reforms. So, looking at the investment scenario, you can see very clearly that if you can get 
more people working, trying to drive that unemployment below five, as you said. Realistically, they want it below four and a half percent. That's what the um, the RVA wants it. They want to actually start seeing real wage growth. So part of that target is to basically what we call absorb the slack in in the employment market. Women are a big, big part of that for obvious reasons. Um, you know, they're they're unfortunately, and look, it's not just women; it's men as well. Let's also probably put that out there. But there are between the ages of 25 and probably 50, childbearing ages, that, that is when a lot of your highest earning potential is at, but you're obviously out of the market looking after kids, doing what you need to do, male or female. Unfortunately, it tends to be majority female, but there is a growing trend that's moving the other way, which is good to see. Why I highlight all that is that from that perspective, that's when you get to your peak earning potential, as in, that's when you're going to probably earn the most amount of money in your life. Once you get past about 50, 55, you start going to part-time work slash retirement. 65, you should be retiring, blah, blah, blah. So you fall away. You start to also, from the government's perspective, get clever with super, start putting more super into it. So the tax revenue they get from you gets smaller. So it's in their interest to get the employment rate lower. It therefore soaks up that, that slack of those people not working because they are doing other things like raising a family, which is great to do but it therefore puts pressure on wages to the upside. Going back to my point though, right at the start of that whole answer around what's happening with childcare is that there's a question here of whether or not you actually, all that you're doing is handing through the cost increase to the government. So if you're subsidizing childcare, that means the childcare provider realistically over time will probably raise the price. So the offset that you're getting ends up being equilibrium. So in the end, the only winner is the childcare provider, particularly the profit ones. There's nothing wrong with that, but the argument structurally would be, okay, if you want for the next 20 years for women between the ages of 25 and 50 and also those, those men that also go, for, go and work from home that have to work from home for kids, if you want them to actually be in work more structurally, securely and also structurally are able to afford that, that program, you probably need to think about putting it under the education system and you need to think about putting it in the same way that the state government schools are run. Um, because then all of a sudden you have a flat fee, right? So you know that it costs mm. you 350 or 500 bucks a year, whatever it is, for state schooling for childcare. And that childcare period is is prime because between zero and five is a long time, particularly when you've got that window for, for people working. So that, that's, I know that's a long-winded answer, but why I say all that is that this is where the budget from both sides of politics, I'm not here to play politics, both sides of politics, in my view, are, are missing what COVID's also done, that 14 months that we've talked about that we haven't you know, talked to each other. The great reset has happened, right? We had the opportunity, the electors and the, the market and all of those and above could actually swallow a change like this. We'd actually probably meet it with quite a reasonable amount of gusto. I mean, last year, you basically got childcare for free. Now, there's an argument that, that should be the way to do it. Well, again, no, from my perspective, because that is just a subsidy, right? It's, it's, not, it's not actually answering the question. The, the question probably should be that you should be looking at it from the point of view that if it was under the education banner and you had it from the point of view that parents knew that they had a state-based or a federal-based education childcare system, all of a sudden that employment problem would go right up quite quickly, which is a really good thing. So that, that's... That's interesting. Yeah, so that's, 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 that's one way to look at what we're talking about here is this budget will be met with a lot of gusto in the short term. But your question to me is how do you look at that, particularly for your world in property and my world in long-term investing? It won't, it'll be a cyclical problem uh, and a cyclical movement rather than possibly a structurally you know, slow linear upcrease that we could have had. And that, that's my argument in this is that it's missed that point is that we could have done something like that. And what I'm going to put to you, I know you're going to ask me the questions, but I want to put to you the other part that I have a problem with so far from what we've seen, and again, obviously the budget comes out tonight, is, and I get a lot of trouble for this, and people have actually told me that I'm super callous and actually have, you know, I'm completely soulless, but I'm going to say this because it needs to be said. For someone in your world, in property, the new movements around aged care, which is to basically to suggest that they're going to provide subsidies to provide aged care in the home. I actually think is also structurally incorrect because it should be, you should be assisting people to downsize or to go into homes, not to be doing it from their own home. Because if you all of a sudden have a scenario where 
that group of people should possibly be downsizing or moving out of their house and selling their house into the market for the next generation. If you're going to actually subsidize people to stay in those houses by doing a new age version of, of, of home care, what does that mean for, for the property market? And what does that mean for the first home home buyer, the second mid-sized family home buyer who can't get in because supply isn't there? What's That's my concern at the moment with the story is, is that's what they're looking like doing. My, my, that's my issue. Do, do you see that as a problem or do you in your world in property or, or how do you look at it? I think there's a few ways to think about that. Um, and I don't know the details of it, but obviously one of the things is they're trying to think about the person that's that's in the home and trying to give them the best yep. care that they can. I agree and having that. looked after older people, my grandmother and stuff, as soon as you start moving people out of their homes and you know the dislodging them, it has, I completely agree with. I understand that completely. Um, and but the it, economics, it, it's, it's tough because you do want to create affordability and you want to help people get into the market. And that can be potentially solved in other ways. You know, uh, I was talking to a gentleman just the other day where we we're talking about um, rezoning chunks of land, so allowing for better quality urban sprawl, yep. um, better master plan communities. So maybe you can't necessarily buy in the area that you want because that property will sell at some point in time. It will be passed down and someone will buy it. It's just a function of when, not if. Um, I think that, as you're saying, I'm really I'm listening to you and what I like is you're saying that in this budget it feels like it's a bit of a short-term cash boost rather than a structural change. Yep. And we could have used this momentous occasion to create some real structural changes in the Australian economy and how we buy, sell, do things and, and never, qualitatively ever improve life. Yeah, never ever forget that, you know, a, a budget is a political thing, unfortunately. Fiscal fiscal mm. policy is a political beast and we are technically inside 12 months to, a, to the next federal election. It has to happen before April 2022. So we're inside 12 months. So do not mistake me at all. This is a pre-budget, um, pre-election budget. That, that is clear. And what I'd also point out, again, not trying to be political, if the Labor Party were in power, they'd be doing exactly the same thing. So don't don't get me wrong here. I'm not here to be critical of, of Canberra, although I will be with regards to how I answer these questions. I, the, what you're hearing from the opposition is exactly the same. It's just been said in a different language. It's the same policies, just in a different language. So there's no difference there in my view. So my question, again, getting back to your point there around mental... I completely agree with that. And that's where I get called callous for what I'm saying. But my other thought is that if you look at this budget, they're talking about infrastructure, right? And infrastructure gets back to your question around employment. And the reason I highlight that is that if you use the aged care sector to actually subdivide that land, as you said, but actually develop it and turn it into housing that they could downsize into, that was then had, you know, your ability to be cared at home, that creates jobs right here and now. It creates an ability to actually liberate that land it has a purpose-built property for those people moving into it it downsizes them and it also brings that other house into the market and realizes capital out of that house because let's be honest that that family home that they've probably been sitting on for minimum 15 years some of them could be holding on to it for, for 15 30, 20 40. 30 40 years all of a sudden you extrapolate that value um, and that if looking at it from an investment point of view that retiree or elderly person in aged care all of a sudden has a level of capital they didn't actually otherwise have, takes pressure off pension. The system. Takes pressure off the system, but it also creates spending power. Um, and that's, Yeah, puts cash back in. Correct. So that, that's, this, is, this is what I mean by the great reset and why what I'm hearing at the moment from both sides and all sides of the political spectrum, this is the miss. This is the miss. We... As a population, have been through such disruption that we're not normally used to. Not only have we completely absorbed that disruption in terms of our daily lives, we're doing this through an internet service. You know, o online discussions were something that we were doing, but not at the level that we're now at. So we have shown that we can take disruption. And government, if they had the real bold ability to to, to realise that, this budget could have done that. They could have said, "Here is a hundred billion dollars." Rather than going straight to just subsidies, let's actually turn that into infrastructure that's designed to go towards aged care, that therefore liberates property that needs to get out there, that uses unutilised land properly. All of a sudden, you've got employment. All of those kinds of things are, are what you know 
my perspective as, as, as somebody that works in strategy and works in investment and works in economics would have been a really bold thing. But again, politicians are politicians and that, that is such a risk to be taking. And to it's a really to hard thing. To, to sell it. Let, but it, I actually think yeah. it could have happened. And that's, that's why I'm so passionate about this in terms of COVID has taught us absolutely no doubt about it that the population can adapt so incredibly well and this could have been a way to actually think about what the next 20 and 30, 40 years look like as the population continues to get bigger. It will get bigger. Um, and how we handle that, particularly in a city like you and I live in where you're in Sydney and I'm in Melbourne. Um, so let, let me ball. ask you, Evan, with, with, with some of the things that we are seeing, um, I've got three, three things in particular I want to ask you because you are right into long-term investments. You're an yep. economist and you do understand the longer implications of things. Short-term is important, but certainly the long-term. Um, we're, we're looking at the, the first home super saver. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that they're increasing it from thirty to fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. What do you see that as a as a good viable tool? And do you understand the mechanics behind that and what that might mean for young Australians looking to buy property as their first property? Yes, I do. So, in terms of being able to buy property, I completely understand it and support it. Um, from from the point of view that all of a sudden you actually have you know your four savings are being used in in your favour. So that, that, that is great. None of that, a lot of people, you know, under 35 find super very hard to get their head around because realistically, I mean, particularly if you talk to a 25-year-old or even a 30-year-old, I mean, a 30-year-old's got 35 years before they can touch it. A 25-year-old's got 40 years until you can touch your super. The caveat is this. For every dollar out of the market, the detrimental effect at your, at your retirement is is just so exponentially large um, in terms of all the studies that show it. So you can't, I can't give you one example because it's on a timeline. So that 25 year old taking their money out, for that 50 grand to go and you know get their first home loan, that 50 grand to re-earn and then do what it needed to do with that 50 grand on and adding what they would have done is, is so in detrimental to your overall total returns longer term that it, from my perspective, I think it's the wrong thing. My theory is that why can't you offer both programs um, in terms of what you're doing? Instead of being able to draw on your super program, can you give tax incentives for people under 35 to not just put into super as your, you know, your immediate deduction that comes from your pay packet, but also say we're going to give you a tax incentive to save it in a super styled system for your homeowners, but it's on your own accord rather than actually touching your, your forced savings in super. Um, so I know that's a, miss, a bit of a half answer. I, I understand the system. I understand why the government is allowing you to now, you know, take up to 50 grand out of your super with what they're proposing. But in terms of your long-term retirement savings, the detrimental effect is extraordinary. And I, I'm not trying to beat it up. Um, because No, no, I understand it. But let me ask you, is, is it that you can take the 50 out or is it you have to contribute up to 50 before you can take a portion of it out? I, so it's a way for you to save yeah. the additional pre-tax it, dollars it, instead of... Yeah, no, you're right. It's that, but it's taking any money out. So I think you'll also be able to, listening at what they're also saying, you'll be able to take up up to 50. So you've got to contribute up to 50K. But if you, let's say, you've got $120,000 in super balances, which if you've been, if you're a 35-year-old, Right, you're mm. probably about there um, in terms of that sort of 120, and, and in terms of where your super balance is probably sitting. There is a suggestion yep. you'll be able to take up to 50k out, so you've contributed the 50k. Wow. So I, again, this is the, the catch with always doing this before the budget comes out and seeing the full regulation and and the numbers. But withdrawing basically even the dollar, you know, a, a dollar out of it, the the compounding effect of that one dollar from let's take the 30-year-old, let's do that. So you've got 35 years to go. If you look at that $1 and take it out, if you think about the idea that the average super fund is giving you about 7 to 8% per annum and you look at that extra dollar and that compounding effect, come 65, that less dollar that you've taken out, the difference that will be there, and this is off the top of my head because I haven't done this calculation for about six months, but your gap's going to be roughly around about 18 to 20% on your performance. 
And that is a significant difference if you take that 18 to 20% when you've taken 20 grand out, right? Or 10 grand. So instead of $1, you've taken 10 grand out to go into your first home. That that's where the, the catch of this has happened. And we've seen that already also with the super drawdown that you're allowed to do during the, the pandemic. So last $10, year, $10,000, you could pull out of it in a panic. Take out. The, the loss, the absolute incredible loss of return that you've had over that year since that's happened. So not only did people take 10 grand out at the bottom or near the bottom of the market, because most people were taking it out through May to June last year, when we absolutely saw the you know the, the the end of the earth fall through, the markets have now not only fully recovered to last year, they're at new record all time highs. So you're talking about a forty five percent jump that most people have missed out on. Um, Good so, news in this side is that Elisa taking the cash to buy another investment, not a TV, right? Yeah, well, well the, yes. So that's what this is. At least this is an investment. At least you're putting it into property, which is another asset that's going to grow to you, rather than taking your ten grand out to. You know, I'm going to say what it is to inverted commas to survive, right? So that yeah. I get why they did it. I do, but unfortunately, the evidence suggests that a lot of them spent it on things that weren't necessarily essential items. They were discretionary items, um, and, and that's that's where this hurts. Um, I get it. I get why they did it. I hope those people did use it for what they were intending to use it. But unfortunately, the the, the even in this one year, we've already seen that the loss that they've experienced in terms of their total returns and what it's going to mean for them at 65 is pretty large. So there's, that's one I'm seeing because I'm obviously a property person and watching yeah, yeah. this. I'm like, oh, where, where are the parts of the market? Where, where are the parts of the market that I see in the budget that are going to stimulate it? And there's two other points that I thought were pretty interesting. I don't know if you saw them. One was that they're going to increase the amount of first home buyer um, – the LMI scheme, so people yes. with 5% deposit, government reporting you 15%, so you don't pay any lenders mortgage insurance. Yep. And they increased that cap to 950000 in Sydney, 850 that Melbourne. Sydney and Melbourne. That captures Sydney and yeah. Melbourne. The argument at the, at the original policy was that it it basically took out, you know, pretty much actually all the eastern states. You'd almost argue that Queensland would fall into there as well um, because it was capped at 600000 was it not? Six hundred k. Uh, so there wasn't a lot you could buy. There wasn't much you could do. And even... You know, Perth itself is out. Western Australia is a little bit different, but Perth, the market was done. You'd even argue that the Adelaide and Tasmania market were, were hard. And let's not even talk about Canberra in terms of what that is because that's just an extraordinary market. So you're right. It sort of missed out in terms of what it does. So 950000 is is much, much better. I think that's a really good way to support the next up-and-coming group because mortgage lenders insurance, you know this better than I do, it's just a suck hole for your money. Um, it's not to protect you, it's to protect the bank from the possibility of you to defaulting. So it's it's dead money immediately in my eyes, and I think it's a, it's a horrible insurance scheme um, in terms of, of what it's there to do. So that, that, I think, is I agree with you, is a positive. But this, this again, gets back down to this push-pull, is that this is money they're borrowing very cheaply. I must put that out there. You know, they are borrowing money at incredibly cheap rates for a very, very long-dated time, which is good to know. Um but someday in the future, we're going to have to start trying to balance these programs up, which means taxation is going to have to be a discussion. Um, where that comes from is, is another question that also isn't answered because we know that 2024, 25, the next set of you know personal income tax brackets gets changed um, in terms of where we see it. So does that mean it's, it's, it's corporate tax? Does it mean it's a royalty? Does it mean all those kind of questions are for the future and and for whichever government's in power at the time. So that, that's, that's, again, getting back to my whole point from the start of this whole discussion is this Subsidies was, versus structural change. Subsidies versus structural. And there is certainly an argument amongst economists and, you know, strategy people like myself that this is a very typical pre-COVID, pre-election period in terms of what we're seeing. It's just that the coalition has probably been shifted away from its normal standard idea of, you know, going down fiscal repair. They're actually throwing money at, at everybody um, to try and basically keep the economy running hot, which is great in the short term and will probably help them for their election. But it's not about 2022. It's not about even 2025. It's about what 2030 looks like. Um, so, it's about so on that point, sorry to interrupt you there, but that's no, really, no, really important because on that point, um, you know, 
we're seeing so much printing. You know, some people that I see or talk to that, uh, that should we be scared about hyperinflation? You yeah, know, so should we be scared about our dollar just devaluing to nothing? And, and why or why not should that be a concern for us? Uh, we, we need a whole other podcast for that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's something that Peter and I talk about, you know. All we time. see that I asset mean, prices are inflating, but, correct. you know, so where's, where's that money going? Does that mean that also asset prices should be included in the inflation gauge? I mean, this is the discussion that you have all around it all the time. Uh, you're also starting to get into the next sort of realm of what will happen over the next 10 to 15, 20 years, the discussion around, you know, modern monetary theory and how that plays into this, all that kind of stuff comes into that question. Um, okay, because it's a beautiful we'll question. One, one after another day. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful question. And it's, it's, it's one. So in terms of your question, do, do we create hyperinflation? The theory suggests you could. The difference with regards to where it comes from, asset price hyperinflation could be argued is happening. I mean, I'd argue in my world in equity land that, you know, you have seen some hyperinflation in, in, in asset prices. Um, you look at some of the, you know, the, the multiples on big tech companies. Um, I mean, it doesn't fall into inflation, but if you think about what you're actually paying for, that's, that's mm. an incredibly inflated price. Um, it's in your world and in property. We know that there are property, you know, hyper movements. But in terms of your everyday hyperinflation, it's going to be hard to see that because that means realistically inflation that the central bank's going to worry about is consumption inflation. So is it going to mean that your costs of your fruit and vegetables, the cost of your fuel of moving your car, the cost of your living standard, not your house, but the actual living costs that you have, so rents are really good ones to sort of throw into this, does that hyperinflate? Maybe. I don't think it will. I think there are certainly downward pressures. The one thing, again, for another discussion for another day is, is globalization and the fact that wages are a big part of this. It's why we're all hearing about employment and employment of the future. Globalization has been interesting. It's a beautiful thing for the way it's improved the whole world. It's a beautiful thing for the flow of goods and the flow of, of widgets, which is what you taught at university. But it's also meant the flow of other things, services and human capital have come with it. So that's why this argument around China exporting its deflation, you know, it pays its people pittance um, because it can. And not only that, it's got four, what, 1.412 billion as officially today, a billion people to service. So there is going to be a huge spectrum of, in terms of their employment. So when they're generating stuff basically next to zero or below cost, and they're also employing people at a much, much cheaper rate than you and I could ever afford to pay people here in Australia because we've got minimum you know, wage standards. That, that's where that, that cap has happened. And that's the discussion around globalisation for the future um, and, and how that works. Because what's interesting right now is we don't have migration. So all of a sudden that, that cap we've been having on, on wages because migration has been actually just constantly keeping the employment market ticking under under utilization because there's more people coming in to the country taking you know a small amount of work now all of a sudden that population growth is disappearing and all of a sudden we have to fill the employment market with the people we have here you're starting to see that really big uptick in employment so that that feeds back into that globalization question is that it shows you that globalization works in many different facets and faces and fronts um but inflation experts expect uh, sorry export from China, India, you know, Southeast Asia has been going on for, for 25 years. And that's why at the moment I don't think inflation will, will continue to go globally and therefore you, you can argue that rates won't move. But again, there are so many other parts and moving parts that and the changing economic environment is is incredible, um, particularly since the GFC. And, and, you know, the states have a big part to play in this. Europe has a big part to play in this. How central gov banks, you know, operate in the future is is it's becoming less and less clear as it once upon a time used to be and that's why it's a very interesting time to be in this world yeah it's it certainly is i hadn't thought about you know exporting our inflation because mm. you know we normally think about um services and goods and people's jobs but you don't think that you know the rate of pay or paying someone uh virtually is now going up but maybe the people here keeps their pay down so yeah. your secretary might earn 60k but that's because i can pay 30k in thailand or correct you know well, russia taking that very that, that's exactly the point and that's where 
The interesting country that I now watch very closely, I think it's the barometer of the future, and unfortunately they're going through a horrendous period right now with COVID, is India. So India have seen mm-hmm. that exact point for the last 20 years. They're a very, very educated population. Um, they are very clever. They're very innovative. Um, but they are more, you know, they do have a democratic society rather than what the Chinese sort of have. Um, so they do also have people that want a certain living standard and they do have, you know, that, that bettering sort of scenario. So that is why they are, in some in their eyes, the service provider to the world. So getting to your secretarial point of view, a lot of people these days are starting to go, well, instead of paying my secretary 60000 Australian dollars, I can go and pay, you know, a secretary in Bangalore for 30,000 rupees, which is roughly around about five grand a year. Um, that's a 55 grand saving to the business. Now, it's pretty clinical, but that's exactly what we're talking about here. That's how you export deflation because the secretary is now unemployed, which is a sad state of affairs. The cost of wages has gone backwards technically, and your overall pickup cost is, is also different. Now, the argument is that the business profit's there, but what we've known over the last couple of years is that businesses aren't reinvesting. They're not actually putting those dividend, the, the, that profit back into themselves. They're either giving it back to shareholders or they're not really doing much with it, and that's the disappointing part. So that, that's part of the, the, the sort of the unfortunate perpetual cycle that we're talking about here is that business inflation, business investment has been anemic, um, and if you want to improve it, you're going to have to start forcing things maybe by regulation to just sort of get around that issue that we just discussed. So I feel like we could chit, chat and just kind of go all over the globe. But I'm going to, I want to bring it, bring it back to Australia and some very specific things in the budget. Um, one line that I really liked and I thought was very interesting um, was the single parents um, scheme where they're allowing single parents to buy properties for the 2% deposit. Um, they're going to give it for 10,000 people and it's, it's structurally aimed at uh, largely like 80% uh, uh, ladies and it's for people earning less than $125,000. Um, again, this is, I think it's a good thing, you know, first and foremost, it's allowing, you know, single parents to get into the market. That's great. Um, but when I read out these lines, as you're saying, all these different types of stimulus, to me it becomes pretty obvious that they're, they're really trying to push the property market. There's tens of thousands of people that they want to, they want to step in as first-time investors yep. and this is at a time when uh, first-time investors really just started to come off. Drop off. So just recently we've seen, yeah, it's coming off. We're seeing investors come into the market and now we're seeing this stimulus to bring, again, first-time property home, homeowners. There's another question I have for you too is who is therefore um, you know, absorbing the risk, right? So, yes, they're obviously – Two percent deposit is is an incredible risk. So, yes, they're obviously going to subsidise a certain amount of it and try and also offset the mortgage lenders' insurance for you. That's great, but you are talking about somebody on a single wage, possibly having to get into the Sydney Melbourne you know market with a minimum of three quarters of a million bucks. And as you said, the the the, the level that they're at is one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. That's gross that's not pre you know that's not after your your taxation so you're realistically forcing my concern is you're forcing incredible risk onto some of the most vulnerable people in 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 the entire population Um, single parents have one two kids to, to look after to support they've also got schooling they've got all other things i think it's a great thing to help them to get into the market i really do but my concern is that what happens after um, once they're in, once they're going, and they're having to then repay their loans, and they all of a sudden look at this loan, and it is, you know, it might be less than what that was before with that two percent deposit because they're now being subsidised to have that loan at fifteen percent and without mortgage lenders insurance. They're still servicing a pretty hefty mortgage. I mean, you're talking about half a million dollars, probably six hundred thousand dollars for the average house that you're thinking about on one hundred and twenty mm. grand gross plus servicing, you know, a family. That's that's a heck of a risk. Um, and if these people were to unfortunately lose their job or the housing market was indeed to come off these, you know, incredible records we're seeing, which it will, then you're also, the banks are going to start asking questions that your, you know, your LVR is on the wrong side of where it needs to be. Your rates could move up. Your repayment levels could move up. It's a big, it's, it, that's my concern with all this is that, in the end, it's a great program for here and now, 
but the risk is just transferred to that individual for the longer term. Um, so how do you help that? I, I want, don't get me wrong, I want this to happen, but I don't think they've thought about what it means for once these people are in. So are they four sellers and then they're back to square one? Um, I mean, okay, or maybe they, huh? Or worse, if you're Correct. a four seller, you, you, I, I talk to people that are, have made terrible investments and bought their own home and, and they, they, they buy the dream and not reality. Um, and when someone's forcing something, they um, they kind of glaze over the dot points, you know. And it's a beautiful way, beautiful they, way of it. It's just yeah, buying, buying the, the dream and not reality. Buying the dream, not the reality. Not only that, it's it's also my way. I've always said about that exact point. I've always looked at it, particularly for our generation. Our generation wanted to buy their parents' house straight off the bat. Um, yeah, I want to buy my mates' area, my family's area. That's yeah. just. Arrogant. Yeah, it's arrogant. And, and, and you, you know, you always want to say to them, go and talk to your parents. Is that the house that your parents had as their first home? No, it wasn't. I'm pretty sure your parents have gone through at least two, maybe even four or five homes before the family home that you remember growing up in is the home that you're in. Um, and that's exactly what you're pointing about. They're selling the, you know, selling the dream and buying the dream rather than buying the reality. And, and unfortunately, it takes time. Investing in property, investing in, in any market takes time time um, and it takes a longer term you know discipline it means that yeah if you get in today you're going to have to wait six or seven years before the housing market probably gets to a level to to turn a profit for you in terms of what you want to do to get to that bigger size it's the same in my world in terms of of what i do in, in listed investments and listed and listed assets is if you're thinking about trying to flip this out in two years time then then i would just say Go to cash. I mean, cash isn't going to give you anything, but I, at least I know that I'm going to give you your capital back because I can't tell you in two years' time that the market's going to be you know, at, a, at a really good price point for you. I do know in seven to 10 to, to 20 years' time with compounding interest and total returns that I'll make it um, and, and that you'll do incredibly well out of it. But you're going to have to put up with the short-term fluctuations and variations and, and market volatility that comes with that in my world. And the property market's no different in terms of what goes on in that space. And that's my concern is people think about what's 12 months' time rather than what they should be thinking about, which is five years' time and 10 years' time. Yeah, these aren't 12-month investments. Correct. And you said something important there, that there's going to be a correction. Property market's going to fall, you know, uh, stocks and things will fall. Let me ask you, when do you see the property market falling and why? What do you think is going to be the great impetus to the market dropping, having a crash? That's a great What are the question. early telltale signs? <sighs> telltale signs, I think, are first and foremost will be a rush in supply. Um, so let's look at 2017, 18, um, when we got to the peak last time. You saw 220,000 homes rather than the 150. Yep. So rush of supply. And I think you might actually start seeing that at the end of this year. And what I mean by we that saw is. We saw a 30% uh, jump in uh, op uh, approvals just recently. Correct. So that, that, that's, that's, that's one, right? Because basically housing in my eyes is beautiful. It's a perfect economics 101, supply and demand. Demand is clearly through the roof. It's starting to ease a bit, but it's through the roof. Supply hasn't come back, but it's starting to show signs that it is. Um, and it's starting to really accelerate because you know those that actually have the supply, those that live in their own home or have got an investment property, what have you, are noticing and are fully aware that the price is up. And they're going to want a good price for it, so they're going to start listing their property. So that's that's the first one that I think is that when you start to see a big rush listings, um, which is why springtime for me is always interesting because that's obviously peak selling period in, in retail world is 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 the spring carnival as I call it, which is spring housing carnival. So that's that's my first indicator. Second will be whether or not the RBA starts to break its promise around not raising rates to twenty twenty four. If you start to see that language, not even alter, just disappear, or they start to, to just to move away from using that, we don't think rates will move for 2024, that to me is also a signal to the banks to start thinking about raising rates. Um, they're already doing it. And what I mean by that is if you look at what they originally were doing, they were giving you fixed rates for four years at under 2%. They've now completely scrapped all those because they know that in four years, rates are going to be higher. So they're giving it to you for two years. It looks fantastic, but they are fully starting to price in rate rises and are starting to try and take advantage of it. Um, that's the next thing, is, is that rates will not stay at 0.1 of 1% forever. Uh, it'll mm -hmm. be for a significant period of time, 
So when rates start to move, that, that's also going to start creating on the demand side, just that question, just enough of a question to say, do I need to take this risk? Possibly not. So all of a sudden, you'll have demand that will still be elevated, don't get me wrong, but it will start to slow. Um, it'll drop out that, that risk investor that we just discussed before and the, the, in, the investor that comes about with that as well. So they, those investor loans that we're now seeing, that, that, that property investor that's returning, they too will basically go, well, I can wait now. I've got my property investments. So I can probably move away. So they're the two things that I'm waiting to see, a rush on in supply and a moving away from discussions about 2024 rate rises. Um, yep. They are my triggers, and I, and I think that's when you'll start to see. And it won't be it won't be noticeable, but you'll start to see an easing off. I remember um, what March last year having a discussion with another property people about this, and they were you know things were moving along. They weren't really taking full. We probably all weren't taking fully seriously the the, the extent of, of the pandemic. But I remember saying at the time, I was saying you've just seen a peak of the market. We're about to see it fall away over the next twelve months, and it obviously had. Well, it's not hard to make that call, um, but that's that's my watch. What I will say to you, don't know if it's going to happen in the next eight to twelve months, though. Um, it just, it just there's just so much momentum in terms of the stimulus package we've discussed over the last 20, 30 minutes. It'll still help it, but it, it it's coming. Like it 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 feels like. 2013 through 18, just on an accelerated basis. I don't know about you, but that's, that's exactly what I feel like. I feel like we're at 2016 going into 2017 where we are in the cycle. Um, it's happened so fast, so rapidly, so since basically since June last year when when everything bar Victoria reopened, you could just see it happening at a rapid rate of knots. All those people that were put in basically into sleep mode came back. That demand that was there in February last year never left. It just re-woke up. Um but it's starting to just show signs that it will lose steam probably this time next year. It's interesting because when things run well for a while, people start looking over their shoulder like it can't be like this for too long. I remember in 2014, 2013, 12, 13, it started running, 14, it yeah. started going. Really running. And really running. And then because it was running so well, people started saying, well, it can't run like this forever. And they're getting scared of a price drop. There was a minute of people getting a bit of fear and anxiety in the market because yep. it was running so well. And then it hammered for another two years. Property, you know, it I just kept on going. I agree with it. Properties, properties, in my view, is also a very hard market to describe because realistically, each individual, in my view, each individual residential property is its own market. So if yep. you if you look at it from the point of view, I don't think the Melbourne market and the Sydney market are the same. I definitely don't think that the Sydney and Adelaide market are the same. There's no way that the Perth market is like anything else in the rest of the country. Um, and then you then think about it from the point of view that if you're in Sydney, you know, they call it the 15-kilometre belt. If you're in Melbourne, it's probably the 8-kilometre the belt um, in terms of – and what I mean by that is that being located to the city. It, uh, uh, you know, Property bears love it. They love to talk about all this kind of stuff that we just discussed. The property market is the property market. You know, if, if people want to buy your home, they're going to buy it. They're just going to buy it. Um, and that's that's the other part of this is that it's not it's not as logical as saying supply and demand. It's not as, yeah, because there is emotion and it's more than emotion. It's, it's family emotion. Like if you can see yourself in that home with your family for 20, 30 years, price means nothing um, in, in that instance. And you see that at an auction. You can just see... People getting carried away with the emotion rather than actually the you know the really hard headed things that you and I are talking about. So there's no real true property market in my view. But what there is is that once you start collating them as a unit um, and you start overlaying things, you can see you know the Greater Melbourne market has you know an X amount to expand before it starts to slow down, or the Greater Sydney market will continue to run, but maybe the you know increases in the average price in Sydney will slow down because the outer suburbs start to go backwards or you do start to see some property squeezes and, you know, people are asking pricing that actually does finally cap out, you know, um, that isn't getting that demand. They have to drop their price down to start catching. So that, that, that's where it happens. But that's why property is always – I love this discussion because it's it's one thing that I think forgets, gets forgotten is that Never underestimate the, the, the love of behavioral finance in my world. And behavior is 
so hard to define and psychology plays into so many things that we do, um, particularly when it comes to property. Bricks and mortar makes people do some funny, funny things. Let me ask you one last thing because I've been chewing your ear off for 45 no, minutes. I've been, I've, been, um, I've been gas bagging for 45 minutes. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is, is, and I borrowed this term from you, you said, Dom, you want, what the government wants is people to feel the wealth effect. Yeah. Well, they want the wealth effect. We are now in the part of the market, for all of you, for you that don't remember what the wealth effect is, it's effectively when people own an asset or property in, in particular, and that asset's grown in value, and now they've got arguably $100,000, $200,000 of additional wealth, that stimulates the economy in a very interesting way. So now that there, there, there is, I would say the wealth effect is in effect, mm-hmm. you know, and people are feeling that, what are the broader implications that you see over the next 6, 12, 24 months for just the market, for other asset classes? What, what are you seeing and hearing and feeling as a result of that? Yeah, and, and that's perfectly the way to – just if you want to actually review that, go and have a look at Westpac Consumer Confidence, right? So for those of you that are listening to this and watching this, if you want to understand what Dom's just talked about, go and have a Westpac's Consumer Confidence. It comes out once a month. It's really easy to find. And it does talk to you about, you know, exactly that they actually try and measure that word that confidence that comes with the wealth effect about what your family finances will be in 12 months time and they also ask you what you think your family finances will be in five years time and what we've seen since june last year is that's rapidly gone through the roof as the wealth effect so it's not just your, your home that you've got you might have have equities you might have a whole range of things that have come together when you look at it as a whole that's increasing it means you start to feel more confident about spending, right? So your, you know, your ability to go out, even as simply as granularly looking at like going to a restaurant. Um, now, there is an argument that probably because of the pandemic, you want to go out because, you know, it, it feels more of something you couldn't do. It got taken away from you by government regulation. You can do it again. But it also, you feel that you can go and spend that 100 bucks at a restaurant because you know you can afford it, if you know what I mean. It's... And it is, it's, it's almost as simple as I get. This gets back to my thing about behavioral finance. It's why I love it is that it's, if you're honest with yourself, ask you, do you feel more confident to go to your local supermarket and buy $150 worth of shopping rather than possibly just getting the essentials and capping yourself at, I don't know, 75? So you're now doubling your spend um, in terms of, of, of you know, staples. Then if you go out to the discretionary store, you, you, you do start, look look at the returns, your JD Hi-Fi's, your Harvey Normans, your Temple and Webster's of this world. They're telling you they're having incredible periods at the moment because people are feeling confident to go out and spend. So this is where that it's, it's, it's accumulative thing. It's sort of like a circle. You feel more wealthy. You feel the ability to then go and spend because you think you have the ability to cover it is the way to also argue it. So... Well, it happens over the next 12 months as we go through, particularly with what's going to happen tonight in the budget, is that they're trying to tell you that we're here to help you from the point of view that we're going to try and keep your wealth going. That feeling you've got around that confidence you've got to spend, we want you to keep it going. And again, it's this perpetual cycle because if you spend, that business has to employ people, more people employed means better wages, means they go out and spend. It keeps going around in a circle. So that that's that's why... You will hear arguments against the wealth effect, but in simplistic terms, it's a reason why so many economists talk about it in quite a vigorous way is that we know it creates, on surveys only, it's not cause and effect, but on you know this survey mantra in terms of how you measure it, that people being more confident leads to economically advantaged things, more spending, more confidence, more ability to do the things that they want to do which actually therefore just continues to keep the economy growing, which is the way and what, you know, the, the whole end of what the government and what central banks are trying to do is to keep the country growing. Um, and that's, that's a long-winded answer, but that's basically where the wealth effect comes into it. There are a lot of people against it, I get that, but it's clear that it works. Um, and in the last year has shown you very clearly that the more people feel they are wealthy, the more confident they are, the more they spend. Great. That's a nice little segue to, you know, people feeling wealthy. Yeah. Um, Evan, thank you very much for your time. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I've, we've certainly covered quite a lot. Um, there's a lot to come out in this budget. We're going to post this video to all of you out there so you can verify some of our thoughts and, 
And if any of you have wrong. questions, yeah. And, and and if any of you have questions for myself or Evan, please let us know. And Evan, it's good to have you. We'll have to have you around again soon. Mate, thank you as always. And uh, yeah, very, very interesting period coming ahead. And good luck to all of you out there with your, your investments, whether it's in property, equities or whatever else it is.